Friends, the Lord be with you. It's good to be in the Lord's house with you tonight. Would you rise and sing with me, O worship the King? Congregation Hour, great God, the only one truly worthy of our worship, greets his people tonight with these words, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, and all God's people said,
So Holy Father, Son, and Spirit, we gather in your house tonight to praise you for your grace, for your faithfulness, um, for the risen Lamb, Jesus Christ, that you sent into the world to be crucified for our sins and who was resurrected because God, you are greater than any adversary, greater than sin, greater than death. And your covenant love um, has bound us all together in Christ. We love you. We thank you for this night, this opportunity um, to say again that we praise your name. In your name we pray. Amen. Uh, friends, would you join me in our statement of faith tonight, the Apostles' Creed? Let's say together, I believe in God, the Father.
Well, how good it is to gather together as God's people to sing praises, to exalt Jesus, to offer our prayers to him as well. And that's what we want to do now in a very particular way. And I want to see if there are any praise reports or prayer requests. So be thinking about that just a moment. Well, let's uh, go to God together in prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, it is so good to be able to gather in your house once again. And to be here, dear Father, to be of one mind and one spirit, and that is to lift up the name of Jesus, our Savior. And to celebrate you as the one true God, and to celebrate your grace and your love and your faithfulness, and the salvation that we have in the name and for the sake of Jesus. Father, it's good and it's right and it's fitting for us to come before you and worship. And we are so grateful for a day that you have provided for us to do that. So grateful for an opportunity to sing our praises and to raise our prayers and to, to offer our gifts and to learn and to study and to know more about you. To be challenged once again to live as your people and, and to live for Jesus every single day. Father, we thank, we're thankful for the opportunity we had this morning to Rejoice in what you're doing amongst our cadet group. We're thankful to hear the report and the many ways that you are blessing our cadets. Thankful for the cadet theme as well that we could spend some time thinking about. And that wonderful promise of prayer that you certainly hear us when we pray, but that you listen, that you care, and that you will answer. Father, that gives us such great confidence in our prayers and not just prayers like this when we come together as your people, but our personal prayers as well. So, Father, we thank you. And we ask that you would help us, each one of us, and together as your body, to continue to be people of prayer. Father, we thank you for the many ways that you bless us. We've heard from Maurice of the blessings of family. We thank you for that. And even as Maurice shares the way that you're blessing his family, we're each reminded of the ways that you're blessing our immediate families and our extended families. And we give you thanks for all of that. The Father, at the same time, some, in fact, are experiencing a loss in their family. And we pray for that, too. And we think particularly tonight of Shelby Ginzink and her family, and the loss of her grandfather, and we think again as well as the Vanderveens and the Van, Van Beeks and the loss of Linda. Father, we ask for your comfort and your peace to be upon them. And Father, we pray that, that you would grant to them a great sense of hope, the hope that comes from knowing Jesus as Savior and Lord. And Father, again tonight we want to pray for Wayne and Boovey as he continues to be in the hospital in Grand Rapids. Father, we know it's been many weeks that he's been there. And again, we hear of little improvements along the way and very grateful for that. But Father, we know that it's been a, a frustrating few weeks for Wayne. And we know that there's many questions that he has. And so we pray, God, that you would calm his spirit, that you would give him the ability to to fully trust in your ways and what you're doing even now and even through him at this moment. Father, too, you continue to be with Hazel and guard and keep and protect her. And Lord, if it be your will that you grant healing, continued healing, and even a full measure of healing to Wayne. We pray for Pastor Bob, too, and we know that he has some blood work coming up at the end of this week and pray that uh, they would hear good results from those tests. Father, as well, we think of the Swearinga family as Vern's twin brother, Jay, has passed away. We know he's been battling this disease of cancer as well, and now you've called him to the end of that race, and he's home with you. And Father, again, we're thankful for that knowledge and thankful uh, for that hope. But Father, we pray for those who mourn. And we ask that as they go through a, a time of remembering him and a time of the memorial and funeral service, Lord, that that would be a time of healing and a time of hope as well. Be with Maurice's dad too, and we pray that you grant him what he stands in need of. We think of, of Will as well. 
We're glad to hear of the recovery that he's making. He's going to be released from the hospital. Father, this has been some time for him as well. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you would restore to him the ability to walk, if that be your will. Give him patience in the process, too. Lord, we think of those who will be traveling, some who are and some will, who will be in the near future. We again think of Judy as, as she's traveling. And we pray that you be with, with Ruth as well and, and her group as they're traveling to Honduras in the near future, working with the Luke Society. We pray, Lord, in the work that is set before them that uh, you would grant them safety in their travel and Lord, that the lives they touch might be truly impacted, not just physically, but spiritually as well. And for Don and Nancy and Carl and Carla, as they travel soon to Guatemala uh, to work and to serve, we pray, Father, the same safety in travel and, and a productive time and a safe time when they're there, and that you would bring all of these folks back to us at the appointed time and safety as well. Father, we, we know as a church family that there's so much else that, that goes on and so many other concerns. And we recognize that there are many of our church family who cannot gather for worship with us on a regular basis, although they would so want to. But they're in nursing homes or retirement centers, and for one reason or the other, they cannot be here. Perhaps it's struggle, struggling physically or perhaps with, with memory. Father, we pray for them and we ask that they would uh, be reminded once again of their part, uh, that they are part of this body. Father, we love them, that you love them as well, that you care for them. And uh, Father, that, uh, that as one part rejoices, every part uh, rejoices with it. And when one part suffers, every part suffers with it too. But that's what the body of Christ is all about. Father, we, we think too of the many needs that surround us in our community in our nation, and even throughout the world. Uh, we have heard of more um, earthquakes uh, around the globe. We, we recognize this earthquake that's happened in Turkey, and the devastation that has followed, and the lives that have been lost, and we pray for those who are hurting. And we pray for those who are in need. We ask that you would provide. And Father, that you would use even this and turn it for, uh, for good and ultimately for your glory. Father, we, we again stand in awe of who you are and this wonderful gift of prayer that you've given to us. And just to know that as we come before you, that you always hear us, that you listen to us, and, and that you will answer. And what confidence that gives us. So, Father, as we close our, our prayer, we do so with gratitude in our hearts. And we do so with the words that Jesus himself taught us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, this time we have the opportunity to give of our gifts, and the offering tonight is for the Calvinist Cadet Corps. I think that is far beyond just our immediate group here, right? It's the general organization. I'm looking at Kevin, and he's shaking his head yes, so I appreciate that. So that's what our offering goes to tonight, and may we give as God leads us to do that this evening. <coughs> seated this time as we sing turn your eyes upon Jesus
I certainly don't mean to embarrass him, but I want to say thanks to Matt for playing your viola tonight. I appreciate that. We all do. Yeah, thanks for that a lot. Well, congregation, tonight uh, we are continuing in our study of uh, Paul's letter to the Philippians. And tonight, very specifically, we're going to be finishing up uh, chapter 1. It's a little bit of a, a bigger text, but it, it all kind of fits together. There's a common theme that we're going to be looking at. Uh, if you've been kind of with us for the past few weeks, you know that uh, we've had two uh, lessons in this so far. We've looked at uh, chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. So to finish off that chapter... We're going to look at verses 12 through 30. So I'm going to read that text a moment for us. You're going to find it on page 1,164 in your pew Bibles there. Page 1,164, Philippians chapter 1, 12 through 30. Here the Apostle Paul writes, is carried along by the Holy Spirit. It says, I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel the former, the, excuse me, the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, I will rejoice, for I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me, yet which I shall choose I cannot tell. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better but to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel, and not frightened in anything by your opponents. This is a clear sign to them of their destruction, but of your salvation, and that from God. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake, engaged in the same conflict that you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. So as far as we're going to read in God's word tonight, and may he bless his word to us this evening. Well, congregation, you may remember, and this was a, a few weeks ago, so I certainly wouldn't hold it against you if you don't, but you might remember that as we kind of entered into this study, we had an introductory session, we did kind of an overview of everything, and at the time, one of the things I highlighted for us was five striking characteristics of this particular letter. And one of those was the fact that essentially, and in a great way, this letter really is a missionary thank you letter, right? We, we know that this church in Philippi was one of the very first churches that Paul planted in that region of Asia Minor. So, so in a way, this letter has a, a sense of being a missionary thank you letter. And, and along those lines, we, we said that Paul includes here in his letter a, a report about his circumstances, and what we have in that text that I just read for us is really just that. Paul is reporting on his situation in prison, right? And it seems that Paul, and, and I'm sure you got the flavor of this as well as you listened to this text just a moment ago, uh, that, that Paul really is, is not negative anyway when it comes to his imprisonment. That in fact, Paul is rather excited about what God is doing 
through his imprisonment, in the midst of his being there in prison. And I, I don't know if you noticed it as I, as I read through that text. You, you probably didn't, and, and that's okay. But, but many times when we read a text, what we'll look for is a, is a key theme or a key word that just keeps popping up over and over again. And certainly that's the case in this text. That's why I said at the beginning, it's a little bit of a longer text than what we might typically do as we work our way through a particular letter like this or any other New Testament letter. But this text is kind of all pulled together by by a key word. In fact, it's a word, uh, even more specifically, it's a name uh, that comes up 11 times in that text that I shared with you. And I'm not going to put anybody on the spot here. You you may be able to guess, particularly if you're looking at the title of the sermon or maybe the outline. But the word is this. I'll just tell you. The word is Christ. That it comes up over and over again, 11 distinct times in our text. And so the point is that in terms of Paul's circumstances... And again, we're talking here about the fact that he is in prison as he is writing this particular letter. The bottom line is for Paul, it's all about Christ. And in that regard, I want to very briefly highlight for us, we're going to work our way through here rather quickly, and I'm going to briefly highlight four things for us. And it's four things I want to give us the opportunity to respond to as well as we go. So as we go, in the midst of the message, we're going to be, we're going to be singing a verse of a song as we go. That's why Renee is still there at the piano. That's why she didn't give up. So we're going to have an opportunity to, to very briefly reflect on these four things and then respond. And that will make a little bit more sense as we get into it here. So four things. So in the first place, Paul says that his imprisonment has served to advance the cause of Christ. Right? That comes out very clear. In fact, as Paul tells us, really, he's reaching people because he's in prison. He's reaching people that he otherwise would probably never have reached. Right? He highlights it for us specifically in verse 13. He talks about the whole imperial guard... As well, he says, kind of all the rest. He just kind of groups them together. In other words, all the rest of those who are just kind of milling around the place where Paul was being kept. So Paul says it's on account of the fact that he is in prison. It's because of his imprisonment that he's had the opportunity to talk with more people. He's he's had the opportunity to share with people, number one, why he's there. And number two, through that, the opportunity actually to share the gospel. So again, simply put, for Paul, it's all about Christ. That's what it is. So I want us to sing about that. And again, we're going to sing about this throughout the course of the message tonight. And the song is going to be one that I think we're familiar with. I will sing of my Redeemer. So think about that first point that Paul's imprisonment has served to advance the cause of Christ. He's got a chance to talk to people he probably never would have had otherwise. Let's sing verse 1. So as we then continue in our text, Paul's going to go on to tell us here that his imprisonment 
has also served to embolden others to actually preach Christ. Right? He puts it this way in verse 14. He says, The brothers, having become confident in the Lord because of my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Now, of course, as we read in our text, Paul kind of goes on there. He says, listen, I know that some people are preaching Christ because they're envious. Maybe it's out of rivalry. Maybe it's kind of selfish ambition. And there's a little bit behind that that we might want to know. There were traveling preachers, and they were kind of itinerant preachers. They would be paid for their services. And so some were kind of hopping on the, the Christian bandwagon for that purpose. And Paul says, I recognize that. I see that. At the same time, he says, I also see that some are proclaiming Christ out of goodwill and love. He says, I understand that. I see that. But he says, you know what? At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter. Because no matter what, Christ is proclaimed. And he's proclaimed boldly. And because of that, says Paul, I rejoice. So once again, it's all about Christ. And about telling the wondrous story. So let's sing verse 2 together. So as we push a little bit further into our text, Paul goes on to highlight a third thing. He says his imprisonment has also served to kind of focus his view, if you will, of life and death. So namely, his imprisonment has helped him to come to terms with the fact that no matter what happens to him, it's his goal that Christ would be exalted. And really, when you, when you look at it, if you take this little chunk of text from our passage, verses 19 through 26, it really gives us some wonderful insight into the heart of the Apostle Paul. Because we want to kind of place ourselves in his position and understand where he's coming from. So here he's, he's writing from prison, right? We, we understand that. And although the sense we get in these verses that Paul has high hopes that he's going to be released, in fact, he he, he sounds very confident about that. I'm going to come to you, right? I'm going to be there and all of these other things that he says. Nevertheless, the fact of the matter is Paul doesn't know, right? Paul doesn't know if he's going to be released or not. He doesn't know if he's going to be, you know, imprisoned for a, a longer time than what he expects. He doesn't know if that imprisonment is actually going to lead to, to something like an execution. He really has no idea whatsoever. Now, we know Right, standing on this side of Paul's whole life, we know that this first Roman captivity was actually nothing compared to what would happen in his second Roman activity. But Paul doesn't know that. He really has no idea whatsoever. So here's Paul. Right? This is his situation. And how does he respond? Right? He doesn't know if he's going to live, if he's going to die. How, what does he say? His singular desire. His singular desire is that Christ is honored, right? Whether it's in his life or in his death. But right? even so, he puts it this way, as we know this verse well, for to me to, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Right? He says it doesn't matter at the end of the day whether I live or whether I die. My desire is that Christ is honored, that the name of Jesus is exalted. And so once again, for Paul, very clearly, it's all about 
Christ. Everything. And so with that in mind, let's sing together verse 3. So finally, as Paul concludes this portion of his letter, he points out also that his imprisonment has served to inspire others to glorify Christ. Right? This is what he says again to those Philippian believers, those original readers. Beginning at verse 27, he says, Whatever happens, let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, Stand firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. For it has been granted to you, he says, that for the sake of Christ, you should not only believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. And so basically, Paul says here, no matter what your situation happens to be, even if God calls you to suffer for the name of Christ, number one, be ready to do so. And number two, be ready to do so in such a way that Christ is glorified. And so essentially Paul says, listen, it's not what happens to you that's important. It's what happens through you that is of primary importance. That every situation, no matter what it happens to be, it's an opportunity to glorify Christ. And so once again, even as we've seen throughout this particular passage, it is all about Christ. Over and over again, it's all about Christ. So let's finish off the song. Let's sing verse 4 together. Now, I'm going to be the first to admit that that was a pretty quick look at this passage. And the fact of the matter is, there is a variety of different ways that we could have gone with this passage. There are things that we could have dug a little bit deeper in. But I went through this passage in this way, in this manner, particularly quickly on purpose. Because I simply did not want to complicate it. Because we have kind of the propensity to do that. Paul didn't make it complicated. It wasn't difficult to understand for him, even while he was there in prison. So I didn't want to complicate it for us, and I want us to understand that just as it was for Paul, that it is the same for us. That no matter our situation, no matter our current circumstance, 
And for many of us, we really can't identify with Paul. I haven't been in prison. I, I haven't been in jail, period. I haven't been in prison for the sake of Christ. I dare to guess that none of us here have. But to understand that in any and every situation we find ourselves in, this cuts across the age realm, wherever it is that God has planted you, where he calls you to be, that just like Paul, it's the same for us. That it's all about Christ. That when it comes to it, that's what it's all about. That it's all about advancing his cause, not ours. It's all about proclaiming his truth. And it's all about bringing honor and glory to him. That's what it's all about. It truly is. And it needs to be always for God's people. For me and for you. It's got to be all about Christ. It really is as simple as that. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, I think we need to stand before you tonight and just confess together that sometimes we make the Christian life so complicated. <laughs> that sometimes we convolute things so much that we truly miss what you're calling in our life to be our number one priority. And that is simply but significantly Christ. That it's all about Christ. That no matter what our circumstance happens to be, that we are called to advance the cause of Christ. That we want to make sure that we are proclaiming His truth. That we want in all things of our life to bring honor and glory only to Him. We see that so clearly in your servant Paul. Father, we want to have it clearly seen in our lives as well. So we pray that you'd help us. We've been singing this song throughout the message, I will sing of my Redeemer. Father, may we take that song with us. May it ring in our hearts. May it resonate in our lives. So again, people will see in us that it's all about you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Would you rise if you're able?
receive God's parting blessing. May the love of God the Father and the grace of Jesus Christ the Son and the fellowship and power of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.